Hey everybody, this is Devon Dudley, and you're watching Expensive Heat right here, right now. Oh my brother, testify! Now get the damn tables. All right, we here after uh, <laughs> technical difficulties yesterday. Um, one half of the most decorated tag team. One half of the reasons why they say uh, we want tables in every arena. Two-time Hall of Famer, Devon Dudley's in the building with us. Good What's morning. What's going on, man? <laughs> I'm doing? good, man. You know, uh, trying to be great. How you doing today? Good, good. Got a flight to catch. Big, big plans I'm today? Going to, um, yeah, well, I got an autograph signing them all. All right, nice. What, um, where you, yeah, what city are you in? Providence, Rhode Island. Ah. Providence, Rhode Island. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so let's get to it. I want to rewind a little bit because I don't think people realize as iconic as you and Bubba are, as the Dudleys, you weren't the original Dudleys in ECW, right? No, there were about five or six of them before me mm -hmm. and Bubba. It was, um, if I'm not mistaken, Snot, um, a couple other guys, right? Snot, Dudley, 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 Big Dick Dudley, and I think Chubby, I think Chubby Dudley. Wow. I don't think people even, you guys took that name to and elevated it so much that people don't even remember that that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, were you and Bubba's chemistry always like A1 since day one? Because like even seeing you guys now, almost 30 years later, like you guys can still pull off one-offs. Like you, you obviously you're not, you know, in your 20s and 30s anymore, but you guys still look good and still doing the things you used to do. Well, I mean, we've slowed down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Father time has caught up yeah. a little bit. <laughs> but at the same token, we're still able to go out there and do what we got to do. You guys still uh, enjoy it when you do do those one-offs, like back in the day? Yeah. I mean, it is cool. I mean, they, they get in, get out. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, that's all I want to do is get in and get out. <laughs> get out healthy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, What's your relationship with, with Spike Dudley these days? You speak to Spike still? We still speak to Spike. Uh, Spike works for an insurance company. He's doing extremely well, has no plans on coming back to wrestling. <laughs> Not even for one he, more. He's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's the smart one in the group. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Spike. Um, Spike took some of the nastiest bumps I think I ever seen. <laughs> like, <what? laughs> yeah, which is why he's on the sideline now. <laughs> Do you think uh, seeing some of the bumps that even you guys handed him, that he's still you know, a lot of guys have a lot of problems these days. Is he, like, still physically good, like, given all of the bumps that he did take back then? I mean, you know, it, number one, the only thing that's different with him, he lost his hair. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I mean, everything is still the same. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's just one of those things where all the bumps that he took over the years, he paid daily for it, yeah. you know? But not to the point where he can't walk or anything. Yeah. But to the point where he had to say, look, stop. Yeah, at some point, right? What is, um? so in that era, because the 90s and early 2000s was a crazy place for wrestling. What's some of the wildest things that didn't make it to the TV for ECW? What's like the top two wildest moments you have in memory? I think the whole thing with the crucifixion with the Sandman and Raven mm. uh, that never made TV. Uh, that was probably the wildest thing I'd ever been involved with in the ECW. But, I mean, other than that, I mean, it was crazy. I don't, what happened with the crucifixion? I'm not in the, in the know for that. Well, one. they nailed, they put Sandman on a cross and then put, like, barbed wire around his head like Jesus had thorn. What the fuck? And I just remember the whole ECW arena. They let out this god awful uh sound as if they're being disapproved of what they were doing. Yeah. Kurt Angle was there visiting, got up and fucking said he'll never come back again. <laughs> no shit. That's crazy. It was that bad. Especially with uh the the Baptist background right there you have, well, how was that to see something yeah. like that? It was it was almost enough for you to say this is too much for me. 
Well, at that point, I was a young kid that was hungry. Yeah. And I really didn't know. I just know that I wasn't involved. Yeah. So it didn't bother me to that extent. Yeah. As long as I wasn't involved in causing it, then I was good. Was there anything back then at ECW that almost made you pack it up? Like, this is... I seen you guys throw people out of arenas. I see, I see some wild shit. What's something that made you say this is this might not be for me? I don't think there was anything <laughs> that was ever done like that for me to say that. Yeah, I enjoyed my whole time in ECW. Had a great experience with a lot of the people there. Had a great boss in Paul Heyman, and I just loved everything about the company. I was just talking to Santino a few days ago. I was, I feel like Paul Heyman is probably one of the the best managers, if not the best managers, promoters, book, and that I can think back to. He's been there forever, and still doing it at such a high level. And like even for somebody like Roman Reigns, which I'm going to get to in a little bit, like to see him elevate that character and and build that bloodline storyline like he's been doing. I feel like he's just. He's just a guy. Like, he's got to be number one in, in terms of that. I mean, Paul Heyman was a phenomenal manager. But you can't forget those that have come before him. Mm -hmm. Bobby the Brain Heenan. Yep. Uh, you know, Jimmy the Mouth of the South Heart. Mm -hmm. You know, the devious one, you know, Mr. Fuji. Mr. Fuji. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, those are just some of the names you know, Paul Ellering, I mean, it was, it's, the list goes on and on back in the 70s and 80s. But as far as the 90s, Paulie definitely was number one. Until this day, do you think he still holds that spot? You don't have managers really anymore. Not like that, right? In pro wrestling. They don't do that anymore. I think it's I a lost art. People come out here and there. Yeah, I mean, it kind of is. But don't you think it should be needed, be though? It adds to the act. I think it adds to the comp to the company in the whole. I mean, think about it. You know, Captain Lou Albano mm -hmm. was known for having the most tag team champions in his stable. Mm -hmm. And you know, when the Bulldogs won the titles from the Greg the Hammer Valentine and Brutus the Barber Beefcake, it was such a huge accomplishment for Captain to be managing the Bulldogs because he added another title to his uh, repertoire in his in his stable. Yeah. You know, um, and, you know, it, it was just great. But now, and think about it, with Bobby Heenan on the road to winning his first WWF championship with Andre the Giant going against Hogan mm -hmm. um, at WrestleMania three, even though he didn't accomplish it. But still, it was made such a big deal. Yeah. It wasn't so much about Andre and Hogan. It wasn't just that. It was Heenan having to manage the heavyweight champion. Yeah. Or possibly, hopefully, to be the heavyweight champion. Mm -hmm. For sure. That definitely helps with, like, the, the foreign wrestlers as well. You know, just, you know, especially mm -hmm. with promo and things like that. I think that's why – I think that died out around, like, like the, the end of, like, Great Kali and things like that where they were kind of needed, right? Like, in terms of promo and things like that? Yeah, I mean, because, you know, like, Kali couldn't really cut a promo mm -hmm. really well. You know, very, you know, impressive with his size mm -hmm. and what he was able to do in there. But a lot of people, when they have managers – they're there to be the mouthpiece to help the talent get over. Yeah. So before we transition from e ECW, uh, I want to know, like, who, say somebody that's a younger crowd right now, they're, they're not in the know for ECW. Who's the, the Mount Rushmore that you tell them? That's who you got to YouTube when you want to get the knowledge about ECW. I think, I think Raven and Tommy Dreamer. Yeah, definitely. I would agree. Um, definitely would be those two because they were the heart and soul of ECW. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying that people like Shane Douglas 
the Dudleys, the Eliminators, the Pitbulls, Mikey Whipbreath, um, you know, uh, Terry Funk and Cactus weren't, but it mm-hmm. was something about Raven and Dreamer that really stood out. Yeah, for sure. So when I was younger, the, the only wrestlers I knew from ECW back then was RVD and Sabu. Like, those were the ones right. that made it to the screens for me to actually see and, like, get in the know with ECW. Do you think, like, their matches elevated the company aside of the, oh. the others? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, there were so many great matches mm-hmm. uh, back then. Other than the blood and violence that me and Bubba <laughs> carried out <laughs> against the gangsters <laughs> and, you know, Tommy Dreamer and Sandman. But there was storytelling in those matches too, mm-hmm. which really helped captivate so many fans. Yeah, for sure. Other than us being different mm-hmm. than WWF, than WCW, we were the alternative to them. But a good one on top of that. Yeah. Um, we basically, you know, helped change the face of pro wrestling. And not too many companies that come around during that time or even after can actually say that they were able to do that. I feel like you guys did. I feel like you guys had, um, you made it relatable. Like, because the WCWs and the WWF at the time, they had a lot of real gimmicky wrestling and things like that. You guys made it as a guy like Sandman, your, your everyday guy you can see at the bar that can just go outside and rumble. You guys weren't flashy. You had the, the the colorful, the shirts, the overalls, the jeans. You kept it relatable to like what we would wear or something like that, and just got in the ring and wrestled. I think that was that was dope. Like even Raven, leather jacket, uh, the denim shorts. It was it was the the backyard feel came from you guys for sure. Well, the I, you know the Raven gimmick, I loved a lot in terms of the look. Mm-hmm. It was like grunge. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, that Seattle. Um, feel mm-hmm. you know like nirvana when they came in and just ripped through yeah the music world you know um you know raven always reminded me of that mm-hmm. uh his music coming out you know you gotta keep them separated <laughs> you know that that song it, it was just it was if i was living when i was in brooklyn and i turned that on i wouldn't keep it on yeah <laughs> that just wasn't my style of music yeah but ECW made you love things that you would have normally loved. Yeah. You know, and those songs were one of them. I guarantee you a lot of brothers back in Brooklyn and all of that who didn't watch ECW before would have never listened to all any of those songs. Yeah. You know, even Pantera, you know, Respect with Rob Van Dam. Mm-hmm. But us as characters made those songs so relatable to people that would never listen to it yeah we were able to help a society that never knew that type of music actually say hey i remember that i know that song you know it is because of wrestling even your even the deadly theme song like uh, especially the wwe one it was heavily rock influenced well, the wwe one yes but listen the, the, the ecw one yeah um, was very silent because <laughs> there was there was no music. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching your interview with um when you guys were up with uh with Corey Graves breaking down ECW and Paulie was saying you were just pirating music back then. It didn't even matter. <laughs> I love that story. It didn't even matter. It was because before Metallica made the big, you know, hump about people using their music and they're not getting paid for mm-hmm. it, which they were right. Yeah. You know, um, you know, but like boxers or UFC guys, any entertainment uh, people that had nothing to really do with music that were using the concept that pro wrestling had done for years mm-hmm. now could no longer use their music. Like the Junkyard Dog coming out to um, another one bites the dust. Yeah. You know, you couldn't do that anymore. Mm. You know, or the Road Warriors coming out to uh, Ozzy Osbourne, Black Sabbath. Yeah. 
uh, Iron Man. So, you know, you couldn't do that anymore. Yeah, for sure. Um, So the transition from ECW to WWF, was that like a big change for you guys? How'd you adjust? For me, no, because I trained the WWE style mm. because of my trainer, Johnny Rhymes, mm-hmm. uh, who was very instrumental in the 70s and 80s uh, with uh, the WWE style, and he taught that. Yeah. So when I came in ECW, I had to learn the ECW hardcore style. Mm. That was different for me. Okay. Uh, but the actual WWE style, that was that was like it was normal to me. Yeah. So, you know, I got to bring up the infamous May Young spot. <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea was that? And what was going through your mind when they pitched it? Vince McMahon. (laughs) I shouldn't be surprised at that answer. I was about to say, with everything that's going on now, it's like, good God. (laughs) He was really sitting back (laughs) doing What were you thinking when they pitched it to you? I said, I'm not doing this. (laughs) In other words, I'm not the one that's going to be putting it through the table. I said, Bubba, you can do it. He was with him with no If something problem. goes wrong, they're going to blame the black guy first. <laughs> was he reluctant uh, yeah. or he was just okay with it? No, Bubba was okay with it. <laughs> you know, he didn't have a problem, but I did. I was like, that's all I need to do was slip and drop that old white lady and it would have been over. <laughs> over. What, career, what, everything would have been done. What was that like backstage after? Because that's not even the first time he put it through a table. I mean, the last time he put it through a table. Like, it was one other time, right? No, one more time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember just everybody was just like, wow. Mm. It was phenomenal. It was great because nothing like that had ever been done. Yeah. Especially to somebody's grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, and for society to be cheering them. That just showed you how sick the world was back then. I was cheering it. An 80-something-year-old woman. I rest my case. <laughs> I feel like now I think back, like, if that was my grandmother, I was like, there's no way I could look at this. Not like <laughs> You would be ready to get a shotgun and shoot me, brother. And, you know? and then she, she wasn't even against it? Like, she was okay with it? No, she wanted to do it off the top of a cage. What the? That's how sick she was. God rest her soul. May Young is a part of some some great moments in wrestling, and I don't know if it was yeah, intended was. to be as great as those moments were, but she added you know, some I great moments. Always, I felt I always felt that it was a shame that she got her recognition later on in her career. Yeah, and and I say that because when she came to WWE during the Attitude Era, you know, she just blew up. Mm-hmm. And nobody had really heard of Mae Young until all of that came out. Yeah. Or unless you were a wrestling historian, you know, and you've been around the business. For, I, I don't know. I just feel like she never got her just due until later on in her career. Even Moolah. Uh, I don't think they re- acknowledge the fact that she's the uh, longest reigning champ. Until recently, again, no. Right? Th- well, Mula basically got her recognition during WrestleMania one mm. when she was taking on Wendy Richter because they told you the story, okay, about Mula. Yeah, and I had never knew that there was a woman's champion because she was basically I, I held the title for over 10, 15 years. That's insane, and you didn't know that until the commentators and Vince and Gorilla Monsoon <clears throat> had put that over. Yeah. And so, you know, it, and Jesse Ventura. So it was just, it was just one of the things that Mula did get her recognition back in 85. So whenever she would make appearances, we knew who Mula was, mm. but we didn't know who Mae Young was. Yeah. I didn't. Again, unless sure. you were a historian. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's 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 a shame that the the what do we do remember our negative side <laughs> of what she did because it's it's the Mark Henry thing, it's the table, like it's it's crazy that that's. But I guess if you're gonna go out, 
known for something is better well, than be forgotten, no? Listen, she enjoyed every bit of it. She was full of life. She loved what she did. And she was happy to be able to contribute to the new generation. Mm-hmm. So I don't think she went out bad in any way, shape, or form. She went out doing what she loved to do. Yeah, that's that's a great way to look and at not, it. And no one can say that they actually do that in life. That's true. That's true. I feel like I, I, I've read that about uh, Vader. He said he wanted to go out in the ring if he could have. Ric Flair says if that's mm-hmm. the way he's going to go, that's the way he wants to go. Um, yeah, that's true. When you break it down like that, that does that sounds a lot better than how we kind of think of the way she passed. Um, mm-hmm. So the first couple of TLC matches, how bad was that in the ring stuff? And like, how long does recovery take for something like that? Because I know you guys get beat up bad in them type of matches. Well, I know for me, it was about a week and a half to two weeks. Man. But remember, we had no break in between. You know, TLC happened on a Sunday at a pay-per-view. And we were back in the ring on Raw on Monday. That's sick. Bandaged up so and we everything. Had to fight the, we had to fight the pain. <laughs> but you know that was going to be as iconic as it was that first one? Because the first one was only a tables match, right? It wasn't even yes, supposed to be. I don't think any of us knew that. That's like asking, you know, some, like would you have thought that The Rock and Hogan would have been so great, so, you know, so history-making? Nobody knows until after it's done. Yeah. Only then will we know how big the match was. You were just happy to everybody to get home safe, right, after that match, because that was a exactly. lot. Exactly. Yeah, there was a lot of danger in the <laughs> matches. Um, For somebody that's not a big fan of heights, how does, does the crowd, like, help you through a lot of those spots? I remember the second one. Is no. that the one you hung? <laughs> no. <laughs> not even a no, little bit. No, knowing that. Vince McMahon was watching <laughs> in the go position. And if you didn't do it, you would get fired. Yeah. And you had a family. That was enough for me. That um hanging from the 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 belt in the second one. How, how'd they talk you into doing that one? Everybody else had their spot that they were gonna do in the match. And the one that was left was that one. Yeah. And of course I'm not gonna be that guy. I ain't doing this. No, that's crazy. And I just went, all right, whatever, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> was it as bad after you actually fell from up there? Was it was would you anticipate it to be a lot worse than it was? It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> I felt every day. Of it. <laughs> so um last question on WWE. Uh I do wanna know, since we did mention Vince, what are your thoughts on what's going on now? Like cause you you were in that company a long time, multiple times. So what you know about Vince and what you've seen and then to hear these things, is it, does it kind of match up or it surprises you? I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't have any comments on the Vince McMahon thing because I'm not into it like a lot of people are. Like, I've read some of the transcripts, but not everything. Yeah. I mean, you know, you are innocent until proven guilty. I agree. But this is very, very strong evidence against him. Yeah. So I don't know if he'll be able to beat this. I don't know. You know, I mean, one thing, the steroid trial in the 90s, he was able to get away from that. But I don't know about this one. It's a different era. Yeah. It's it's, it's interesting, too, because even if it seems consensual, it could still be used against you. Like, it's it's a wild... It's a wild situation. Listen, it's the thing where, you know, you get mad, you're mad at the girl, you go off on her, you kick her out of your room, nothing's ever happened, she's downstairs crying, and she goes, he raped me. Yeah. You're already guilty before you even, you know, being judged by your peers. Yeah, for sure. You know, so, I mean, that's the way it works, but, you know, Listen, I can, all I can do is pray for the situation. Yeah, for pray sure. Pray for the young girl. I agree. You know, I mean, she went through some horrible, horrific times. Yeah. And so many women before her, you know, went through, you know, whether it be in the wrestling business, Hollywood, anywhere. I mean, you got to feel bad for the victims. Yeah, definitely. I agree. You know, and pray for them. Yeah. 
I agree for sure. Um, so past the Vince thing, it's interesting because you're actually wearing the Aces and Ace shirt. Um, how do you rank that storyline in your career? Because I'm biased. I'm a Sons of Anarchy fan. So when I seen that building, I didn't, in the beginning with the masks and all, I didn't get it. But once it actually became what it became, I was a big fan of that. How do you rank that in your career? I, I rank it as one of the best storylines I had ever did. Yeah. Uh, very, very grateful for Eric Bischoff mm -hmm. coming up with the idea of doing this and helping me to be a part of it. Yeah. Him and Hogan both. Because uh, I had left the company, I had quit, mm. and they were wondering how we can get me back and to you know be a part of this. And like you, I'm a big fan of Sons of Anarchy as well. Mm -hmm. So when the opportunity came, I pretty much said, "Yep, I'll do it." <laughs> nice. And you had a lot of people in the stable, so it wasn't as like you had to perform every night. It was, it was, it had that NWO vibe to it. After a while, it was almost too many members, but it was still enough because yeah. of the, the, the concept was there, biker gang style. Like, so you kind of expect a lot of members. I feel like th mm -hmm. that being uh, the critique of it might not have been fair because I think that fit the, the storyline you were trying to tell, no? Yes. I mean, you know, the old ladies and the biker life, how, you know, they live. We tried to portray it as best as we possibly could. Yeah. You know, um, during that particular story. And I think we did a great job in doing it. I think so too. I agree. For sure. Um, two more questions. Um, do you still recently the last company you worked for was WWE, right? Yes. So do you still watch the product today? You get a chance? Uh, not really, you know. I got kids, I got my family life at home, and I refuse to let the business uh, take control of my life again and take away from the family. So I can't sit in front of the TV and watch three to four hours of wrestling, mm -hmm. you know, like I used to, you know. I take a back seat now. I, I see things here and there. So with, with Heyman, I'm liking the fact that WWE is just doing extremely well. Extremely well. Um, with Heyman and um, with The Rock and, and Roman Reigns, if you're familiar with it, how do you how are you like liking that storyline the way it's developing? I think Triple H is doing a crazy job with with making people love wrestling again. And this you know, I wish I would have been able to be under the regime of, of Triple H. I was under Vince's uh, thumb, but I never worked for Hunter. Mm -hmm. Although Hunter was the one that hired me, oh yeah, as a uh, producer. Nice. Yeah, so I, I'm very grateful for Triple H, and um, I, I really am happy and really like this. I don't want to say proud because it ain't, but you know, it's not like he's my son or something. But I'm very happy for him. As a peer, you can be proud and all of his, and all of his success. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I can do it that way, but I'm just very happy of all the success that's going on right now yeah. and how he's taking that company and just really, really taking off with it. I love it, too, because guys like you are, are pillars in WWE, right? So to see it yeah. not go down the drain but continue to grow, I feel like it. You know, somebody like you would be appreciative because you helped build it. You, you're the foundation of what we're watching today. The fact that these guys pull tables out and, and they chant it because of you guys – you you know you're still very influential even when you're not there. Thank God for that; it keeps us relevant. That's <laughs> um, you know. we've seen you reunite with Bubba, like I said earlier, a couple of times. Uh, Jericho Cruz, you uh, what was it, the hundredth episode of Impact? I believe. Yeah, it's one thousand. One thousand. There you go. Um, I seen Bubba tweet that you know wrestling at forty would be great. Would you guys got another one off left? If the if the phone rings. I think we come. I think we just do the greatest hits. The greatest hits. The greatest hits. The what's up? The three D belly to back neck breaker. You know, LOD tribute. You know, um, I think stuff like that. But you, you, you're ready if that phone rings for one more go. I don't know how ready, but I. <laughs> I, I 
<laughs> we'll see, right? I'll be okay with it. All right, beautiful. Um, what's it like having your sons wrestling these days? I mean, it's great. They've been doing it since 2013, so mm. you know. But they're just getting their dress due, so I'm happy for that. They were really good. I'm very proud of them, and you know, I hope they do way many times better. Yeah. Way time, way times better. Excuse me. Than uh, me and Bubba did. You always want your kids to surpass you. Definitely.